Hör mal an. It's December the 15th, 2020. I'm Chris, this is Henry and this is Curiously Polar. And uh, this is our new video intro. What do you think, Henry? I love it. It's amazing. It looks great. <lacht> it's, it's I'm a very visual time. person. It's exactly. about time to make this a bit more visually appealing for the video viewers. I think the audio viewers don't really have a, any difference there. It's our normal intro music and everything is as usual. But if, you, if you're there listening is another, to this... Hmm? Another nice incentive to just swap over to YouTube and uh, check out the video version of this podcast. <laughs> But on the other hand, you know... I, so I started podcasting 16 years ago and the one thing that I still find very, very appealing about this medium is that it is an acoustic medium first and foremost Indeed, yeah. because, because you, can, you can hear, uh, you can listen to podcasts anywhere now. You have a smartphone, you have some earplugs, you can listen to them doing your chores, walking the dog, um, going shopping, doing whatever you want. And, uh, That's true. So, so you have your hands free and your eyes free while doing it, while while video. Yeah, I'm, I'm is mainly usually... listening to podcasts while driving a car or just while in the car, while yes. cleaning the home. So the commute it's, is it's a very, very yeah. Indeed, it's a very audio um, <laughs> medium. So yeah. So 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 I just want to make sure everyone understands that I w this th this will be a audio podcast. This is the first and foremost uh, medium for this podcast is audio. But having That said, there is uh, almost in every episode now we have a we have a video, a, a visual component because um, d you bring a topic and then there's some 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 things to show, some maps, some videos, some things that support what we're talking about. But um, if you're listening to this and uh, if we ever and we will do a, we will make an effort to help everyone understand what's going on, so we'll usually explain what's on the screen. Uh, if we ever forget that is definitely possible, is entirely possible, then please let us know um, if, if, because it, it, again, it's first and foremost, it's a, it's a, it's an audio medium. And uh, yeah, that's what makes podcasts so wonderful. You can consume them almost anywhere and do other things at the same time. So let's get into this episode. Um, mysterious Antarctic murders. Is this going to be a bit of a gruesome episode? <laughs> it's a kind of a mystery episode and uh -huh. when you when you work in an article it uh, kind of comes it, the question comes to mind how do you actually pursue crimes how do you actually investigate them and who's investigating them and i was asking that uh, question myself and um just yeah digged a little bit into that topic and Is there the outcome was actually police? No, there's not, and that's a that's a funny thing. When you look at Antarctica, there there is there are a number of territorial claims as we uh, established in a earlier episode, um, which kind of are frozen um, within the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in '56, and since then there is no well there there is this rule of law by the Antarctic Treaty system, but there is no jurisdiction. So how how is is a is a crime handled or how are uh, violations of, of law handled? And that's a very interesting question. And um, I would just ask you, what do you think? How, how do you how do you imagine if something happens on a research station? How is that handled? Well, uh, those are communities. So I I would okay. So so the closest comparison that I have to places where there's no police force uh, to handle things is um, I spent some time, just vacation time, several weeks in the past up in Sweden, somewhere deep in the forest and in, um, in, in places where the next community is like 10 miles away and that next community is three, three houses. So there's, if, if someone, <laughs> something happens there, people will probably just talk it out. But uh, then I think we should define is what is the thing that's happening. I mean, we have murders in the title of this episode, so we're talking about just not just not just someone stealing someone's um, snowmobile. I think we're talking about much more serious <laughs> things, right? But but just let's set the scene right. So we are on Antarctica, the most remote continent, no native population, 
In winter time, we have roughly 1,000 scientists spread over this continent, 14 million square kilometers in size. And those 1,000 scientists, which sounds like 1,000 sounds large in the first place, but <laughs> putting into scale with the size of Antarctica, it's ridiculously small groups, and they are locked into science stations and, and research stations. And they're locked in four to six months in complete darkness. And I mean, you and me, we've we've seen a couple of pictures of research stations from the inside. We looked into a new build um, in the last episode. Do you think six months in a even in a new build station with all those amenities of a pool table and a gym and those nice lookout lounges? Do you think that's a an easy way to go in six months? I think I think you'll get uh, cabin fever sooner or later. I mean, I think that is probably one of the main causes Certainly. of things to happen. I don't think that between those research stations that things are happening there. But I believe that no, it's not like a, too like far an away, interstation right? war. No, no. <laughs> exactly. But but I think I think if you are stuck with the same people uh, for for six months uh, in a building um, and you don't have enough space to really get away from everyone, then. I can imagine little things becoming pretty dramatic, like uh, leaving the toothpaste open, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it's not even only that. Um, there are other factors coming into play, and that's just where people are locked up. Usually, uh, the, the consumption of alcohol um, is significantly higher than in uh, more mm -hmm. open and more lightful uh, spaces. So there are a number of factors coming together and then yes there there happen incidents where a violence is just bursting out and there is a long list of of incidents that's happening there but what happens when those incidents happen so let's say there is an attack from one um staff member to another who's that hand uh, who's handling that um how is that treated and who is um you're charging over over those incidents i mean it sounds and a bit like wild west you know the is there is there someone like is do do they do they agree upon the eldest to be a sheriff kind of person or almost almost okay. there there is a system which you can find in almost all science uh, stations in Antarctica and that's that the station leader is kind of um, the prosecutor and judge um, <clears throat> for okay. smaller uh, for 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 minor incidents let's say um, yeah if someone um, just you violently attack someone or break something or steal something or so on just those those minor incidents where there is no uh, physical harm and when it comes to physical harm then we have um the jurisdiction of the country that actually runs the station um that comes into place which is for example for for the largest um research facility which is McMurdo station in the ross sea that's um, a nice name, oh. <laughs> McMurder Station. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, of course, the, the, the U.S. that governs there, even though it is in the uh, 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 New Zealand claim of the Antarctic Territory. Um, the claim here of the dependency doesn't really play a role. So it's um, solely the... Um, yeah, the sovereignty of the country that runs the, the, the research station. But then you also have research stations like Concordia, for example, which is in uh, East Antarctica, which is run by two countries at the same time, France and uh, Italy. So you see, it, it comes a little bit um, difficult. So the, the next rule would then be that uh, the, the case is um, you yeah, heard from a from a court of the nationality of the the person that is convicted, and that's a very interesting um, rule. And I just brought one case um, today. We can just go through a list of incidents, but there's there's one case I would love to dig a little bit deeper into. Happened in the year two thousand at the South Pole Station, Scott Amundsen Station, which is run by the National Science Foundation of the United States, but it hires a number of international scientists. And there, something happened in 2000, which might be a murder, might be not. And this incident is um, today's topic. But before we're diving into that, 
I would love to give a little, just a brief overview of a, um, a number of incidents, which kind of funny in a retrospective. It's mm. certainly not funny in the moment when you just, um, yeah, when, when you're just in the middle of the action, but we actually can trace back um, those cabin fever uh, incidents to the 1940s when um, a Norwegian immigrant who was an expedition leader of an, a private American uh, expedition has um, yeah, rarely escaped an attempted killing um, because he just frustrated his, uh, his team so much that uh, members of, of his expedition team just tried to kill him. Ouch. And he just... He just jumped off and um, uh, could get um, help from the from the rest of the team and uh, like get out. In the 1950s, um, at the Australians' uh, Mawson um, Mawson base in uh, East Antarctica, had um, quite some um, violent derangement within the station. It got locked up in 1959. It's probably the the most famous one, um, where two uh, Russian scientists at the Vostok station. Um, played chess and just got into a fight over this um, chess game and according to different sources um, the, the attacker attacked the uh, the opponent with an ice axe and different sources say it killed him other sources say it wasn't fatal it's not really clear what happened here um, it's very difficult to find actually um, yeah yeah material from um, the, the, from the Russians themselves it's not really clear. Was that the first murder in Antarctica? Wasn't it? I don't know. In 1981, um, in McMurdo Station, um, yeah, people tried to burn down uh, the chapel. Then in 1983, 84, um, the station leader slash doctor of the Almirante Brown Station in Paradise Harbor on the Antarctic Peninsula um, he wanted desperately to come home, but got the order to stay one more winter. And to avoid that, he just burned down the station. So he got rescued and got <laughs> just deployed to That's Palmer crazy. Station. And uh, later got actually charged in, uh, in Argentine, Argentina. But then we also have like very regular um, mismatches people are just getting drunk and uh, get into an argument and then start fighting as happened in 2009 and uh, we just brought um a, a video clip from the south korean uh, television which has material of that incident um in in, in july 2009 and it is actually a quite graphical um incident so this is not for the faint of heart i'm gonna play it but uh there pe people are gonna get hurt in this video so there's there's yeah, surveillance a, video there. Exactly. So there's a surveillance camera um, in the in the station. It's oh. um, yeah, it's a Sejong station on King George Island of uh, South Korea, and yeah, there's a one drunk staffer who attacked the cook of the station, and um, a crew member tries to um, yeah to to separate those two, and just got attacked himself by the by the drunken staffer it took a while to um get this man down but uh yeah that was a serious incident and just shows how quickly things can develop when the wrong wow. factors are coming together and that's here isolation it's darkness it's alcohol it's a number of things and um they can develop uh, quite badly actually yeah but we have we have to say that is not the norm this uh, it's not the norm these no. are, these are you can see, uh, rare but but they do happen these incidents we, we have a number of incidents but they date back to the 1940s so it's yeah. not that we have uh, 10 incidents a year we have one to two incidents to t all 10 years but yeah. of course um the one i would love to talk about today happened in um in 2000 and in 2000 uh, an australian scientist in the Amundsen Scott station uh, at the South Pole, just felt sick in uh, in May, eleventh uh, of May. He just felt sick, and he went to uh, the station doctor. The station doctor um, uh, just looked at him and uh, couldn't find anything. The day after he died, and that was a very sudden death because it was actually quite a healthy man, and uh, he just bought a new house. He was financially stable. He, so he went into he a felt new sick and then relationship. Died. 
Exactly. He felt sick. He felt uh, nausea and then just died the next day. Um, but it's May. It's the beginning of winter. So what can you do? You can't evacuate the body. So I just put the body in the freezer for almost six months mm -hmm. before it then got transferred to New Zealand, where actually the hub is for the American Antarctic program. So all the American uh, logistics go through Christchurch in New Zealand, where they have their logistics hub. So if you go to uh, the South Pole Station, if you go to McMurdo, um, it doesn't really matter, or Palmer Station, you go through that hub in Christchurch. So the other way around obviously goes through the same hub. So they transfer the body to Christchurch, and in Christchurch, the corona just um, examined the, the, the body and could actually find a methanol uh, poisoning in the body. Oh, For first thoughts when you hear uh, methanol poisoning are three options. So it might have been a suicide, it might have been an accident, or it might have been intentional. The suicide could have been ruled out fairly quickly because of the situation. He wasn't in, in a fresh relationship. He was financially stable. He almost finished his research project. Um, there was no indicator that showed that he was depressive or anything. There was no indication that he actually could commit suicide himself. And then you have the two options left, intentionally or accidentally. Accidentally could never be ruled out because he was known to binge drink to just have those those moments where he just like gets completely um filled up and yeah just enjoys himself uh, in, in those situations and it might have been the possibility that he just mixed some ethanol and methanol which are very close to each other and in that case just poisoned himself accidentally not even knowing what he was drinking but at the same time the officials couldn't rule out that there might have been an intentional poisoning. Yeah. And why did that could not be ruled out? And that brings in the next big um, question mark in research in Antarctica is the missing cooperation of the operator of the research facility. So we have the owner, which is the National Science, uh, Science Foundation, and the National Science Foundation in the US has a company that operates the research station and hires um, the staff members for the facility. In this ca case, it's uh, Wraith and Polar Services. One of the largest co um, corporations in the world has a polar services division, and they're hiring the staff. And for some reason, which still remains a mystery, they didn't cooperate on that case, Probably because in the US they there is this uh, yeah, kind kind of um, scenario that they don't put American citizen into legal hands of other countries. So they probably just wanted to protect um, American citizen. We don't know. All of that is just uh, speculative. However, what could have been um, unveiled is that he got poisoned. So the the cause of death is clear the circumstances how that happened they remained unclear and through all, all those years there have been investigations over and over again that could not be answered clearly so that's one of several mysteries but this, uh, yeah certainly a crime mystery in the heart of antarctica the southernmost point of the globe and that's quite remarkable when you see that the people who are heading down there are most of the time the most qualified scientists in the world. You expect they can just get along with each other. But in the end, we're all human, no matter what kind of background we have. And there might be people we just can't stand. And then you just stop with them for the whole winter. It's interesting because it because because there are other situations where people spend a long time together in a very limited space. I mean, the International Space Station, for example is one of those things. And um, I believe there are special kind of psychological things. Uh, before you send someone up, you have to figure out if they are compatible, if um, if those things will not happen. Because I, I don't remember hearing any anything about any events at the ISS where someone would hit someone else. Um, so at least that's, but I think that's the never been public, I think. So... Um, that, that's the true, but I think the, the space someone... station 
has a little um, more in-depth analysis of the psyche of the people. Who, That's what I mean. And, there, and if you send there. someone to, to the same research station to the Antarctic, that doesn't seem to happen. So the <laughs> question is, should, should that maybe happen? That's a learning out of a number of cases, and yeah. that's treated differently from um, country to country. But of course, you have a number of people who are regularly are heading down um, into those research stations. But still, that doesn't rule out the possibility that there is a point reached where things are just escalating. And that happened in uh, 2018, which is not that long ago, in October 2019, in the Russian Bellingshausen uh, station at King George Island, where they ended a, in a physical attack, just in a, in a severe injury. So the person that got injured needed to be evacuated to Chile to just get, get a surgery and recovered um, locally very quickly. The attacker actually surrendered to, to the station leader and uh, just got you know, locked up into the Orthodox Church of um, of the station. They have the only Orthodox <laughs> Church in There's, there's in no Antarctica. prison there, so you lock them in the church. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wow. you, you don't have containment areas in, in, in that way. And uh, then just got sent home on his own, by the way, on just commercial flights. And then in St. Petersburg, got his, uh, his charge and his uh, court ruling. So you see, things are handled a little different there. In in Russia, it's um, not entirely clear who is actually handling um, those cases. If, that, if there's one particular entity that's doing that in the US, for example, the, the, the station leader, the, the two station leaders of McMurdo Station, they are specially trained and they are appointed special deputies of the US Marshal Service. And they have a clear um, connection to the uh, US Marshal Service in Hawaii, which is responsible for Antarctica in, in that way. So agents um, are just trained there or the, the yeah, look, the, the station leader is trained there as a marshal and can handle like minor uh, things for larger things. Then, of course, they bring in more professional um, personnel, like, for example, in 1996, when there were three FBI agents sent down to McMurdo to investigate um, an assault case. Yeah. Oh, OK. So you, you it's 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 quite interesting. I didn't got any feedback how that's uh, handled on on other stations yet. It would be nice to have a uh, a follow up on that. But you can see it's not as easy as we think. However, in case of those three FBI agents sent down, it must be a fairly interesting um, task when you just get appointed to investigation in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. Nice business trip, I think. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, well. So, mystery murders. Hmm. Well, I, I, by the way, uh, one, one thing that reminds me of is a book that I've uh, read when I was maybe 17. Um, have you read uh, uh, Solaris by Stanislav Lem? A Polish oh, no. author. I just remember the movie. Um, the the movie. I didn't like the movie that much, but the book is a is a different story. So um, I've just pulled this up here on the side. If anyone's in, and this is about a, a a station on a different planet, and they are trying to research the um, an intelligence on that planet. And uh, one person comes to that, visits the planet, or visits the station and finds a very interesting situation. And it has a bit to do with um, the, the the cabin fever that you can get. Or, or at least that's uh, an assumption that's happening there. So it, the Solaris, the highest uh, recommendation to read, um, to, to look at that kind of a complex of topics uh, from a bit of a different perspective. So I guess that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, we are going to be back soon. Until then, uh, of course, you can follow us on our social media. We are at Curiously Polar on Twitter, on Insta. We are at uh, www.curiouslypolar.com on the web. And of course, you can find us wherever you find your other podcasts. Um, we'll be back 
pretty soon. Until then, everyone, take care and.